Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of OEFC in Excel. And this week we've reached Acts 27 and Paul's torturous journey from Caesarea to, to Rome. Since ancient times, writers have depicted life as a journey or a voyage. John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress is based on this theme. Nelson Mandela entitled his autobiography, The Long Walk to Freedom. And people use the concept of the sea voyage as a metaphor for life in everyday speech. We talk about an experience being plain sailing, or we have entered a, a time of calm waters. However, when troubles arrive, we talk about storms. And the sort of stormy picture we have in mind is that of a, a ship being buffeted by huge waves, taking in water and in danger of going under. Often when our, our lives are going well, we can persuade ourselves that we are exempt from storms. They don't affect us, we are immune. They only affect other less fortunate people. But of course, that's nonsense. Storms do come into our lives. They come suddenly, they come unexpectedly, and they're fierce. One day we can feel as fit as a butcher's dog, and the next we experience intolerable pain and find ourselves in hospital. The doctor's diagnosis is not encouraging. We will require long-term treatment, the side, of which, the side effects of which are not very pleasant. Or perhaps one evening we get a call. Our son or daughter's marriage is broken irretrievably down. He or she is at rock bottom and a once secure future is in all sorts of doubt. The home will have to be sold and the custody of the grandchildren will have to be worked out. Perhaps one morning you arrive at work as normal and your boss calls you into his office. He hands you a letter. The management have decided upon a course of restructuring. Sadly, you are no longer in their plans and after 20 odd years of service to the company, they're going to have to let you go. None of us are impervious to the storms of life. We all at some point in life's journey will experience loss, grief, hurt or crushing disappointment. Now, Acts chapter 27 reads a bit like a, an Alistair McLean adventure novel. There is a, a sea voyage to Rome. There is a storm. There is suspense. There is a shipwreck. And there is a safe landing on shore. And the events of the voyage are meticulously recorded. It seems Luke kept a daily journal of the journal journey. The wee passages of the chapter indicate that he was on board and was a, a first-hand witness of the unfolding dra drama. But although Acts 27 is a, an enthralling story, it is also a metaphor of what all Christians experience in their voyage through life. It's not a pleasure cruise on the quiet waters of a lake. It's rather a voyage on the open seas where out of nowhere a squall can descend on our tiny boat of life, threatening to capsize it. So what does this passage have to teach us about facing storms? It will be tempting to make the Apostle Paul the hero of the story. His actions throughout the story are heroic. He begins the voyage as a prisoner, but during the course of the voyage, we get the impression he becomes the captain of the ship. In the words of the opening lines of Rudyard Kipling's famous poem, If, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Well, that's Paul. Under the most extreme of circumstances, he keeps it together and shows outstanding leadership. But despite Paul's heroics, the true hero of the passage is God. Although he's only mentioned a few times directly, his unseen hand is at the tiller of events. God is the anchor for the Christian 
in the storms of life. There are three attributes of God the anchor I would like to point out from today's passage. Firstly, along the journey of life, God gives much evidence of his grace. Why is Paul on his way to Italy? Well, on one level, he has utilized his right as a Roman citizen to have his legal case heard by the emperor of the Roman Empire. He's appealed to Caesar. But on a deeper level, the Lord Jesus had appeared to him in his prison cell in Jerusalem two years earlier to encourage him. The Lord Jesus assures his the apostle, despite his life being in great danger, it wouldn't end in Jerusalem. He would one day preach the gospel in Rome, in the epicenter of the Roman Empire. So Paul is making this potentially hazardous voyage in the knowledge it is in the revealed will of God. What tangible signs of God's grace does he give to Paul from the outset? Well, we see it in two ways. Firstly, through the companionship of other Christians. Paul does not bow, board that boat alone. He has two companions for the journey. Luke the doctor and Aristarchus the Thessalonian are with him. Some commentators have suggested that as a Roman citizen, he had the privilege of being able to take servants along with him. If that is correct, both men voluntarily took upon themselves the role of servanthood. They were freemen, but they made themselves servants in order to support Paul spiritually and practically during the journey. How grateful to God we should be for Christian companions in the journey of life. For a Christian husband or wife, a long-standing Christian friend, a Christian family member, or perhaps a Christian brother or sister to help us through a particular crisis of faith. The pastor and author, Kent Hughes, relates the story of how he was going through some dark days, some of the darkest he'd ever known in Christian ministry. He felt alone. He could sense neither the presence nor the grace of God. In desperation one evening, he shared his feeling of being forsaken by God with his wife, Barbara. She said these life-giving words to him. Hold on to my faith. I have enough faith for both of us. It was just the reassurance from God he needed at this time when he felt consumed by darkness. He could lean on his wife's faith while his own seemed shattered into pieces and in need of rebuilding. Praise God for the grace of Christian companionship when we feel our own dark night of the soul. But we also see the evidence of God's grace towards Paul through the kindness of strangers. Boarding the ship, Paul and the other prisoners, quite possibly condemned men destined to meet their fate in the Roman amphitheatre, are placed under the charge of Julius, the Roman centurion. They make their way up the coast and land at the port of Sidon. But Julius is a humane man. He allows Paul to disembark and to go to some fellow Christians in Sidon to enjoy their hospitality and to receive some supplies for the journey. The centurion didn't do it because he wanted something in return from Paul. He did it out of consideration. He did it out of human decency. He did it out of kindness. Julius had barely got to know Paul, so it was the kindness of a stranger. That humanity of the centurion would reappear later in the chapter as well. In life, we all encounter the kindness of strangers. We will all be the beneficiaries of the thoughtfulness of other people who do not claim to follow Jesus Christ, but are considerate of those in need. It might be a kindly teacher at school who encourages our nervous children beginning a new school year. It might be a midwife reassuring anxious first time parents during the birthing process. It might be a considerate employer lending his support to us through a family crisis. It might be the cancer nurse 
not just treating the body, but showing care for the whole person. It might be the gentleness of a care worker in a care home for whom nothing is too much trouble. But behind the kindness of a stranger is the grace of God towards us. So along the journey of life, God gives much evidence of his grace. But secondly, in the storms of life, God speaks to us. After leaving the port of Fairhavens on the south side of Crete, a gentle wind takes the ship westwards along the southern coastline of the island. But it isn't long before a hurricane sweeps the ship out into the Mediterranean Sea. And in the open seas, it is at the mercy of the storm. The ship is buffeted by huge waves and the storm shows no sign of blowing itself out. It goes on for days and days. Desperate times call for desperate measures. So first the cargo is thrown overboard to lighten the load. The following day, the ship's tackle is thrown overboard. Still the storm rages on. The wind roars, the boat rocks violently as first the bow, then the stern rise high in the air, only to plunge quickly down again. The constant motion induces seasickness and it makes it difficult to stand, let alone walk. The storm clouds cover the skies during the hiding the sun during the day and the stars at night for what seems like an eternity. The morale of everyone on board is drained. Everyone realizes the hopelessness of their situation. Surely a watery grave awaited them all. They'd given up all hope of a safe landing in Italy. We can only assume when Paul wrote all, he meant Paul too. When Luke wrote Paul, uh, all, he meant Paul too. Even Paul, to whom the Lord Jesus had appeared on several occasions, was at the end of his tether. Even the great apostle to whom the Lord Jesus had given a specific promise that he would preach the gospel in Rome had gone beyond the point of hope. Even Paul saw no other outcome for those on board than the reality of an awful death by drowning. But then, at this moment of absolute despair, God speaks in the storm. An angel of the God to whom Paul belongs appears to him in the storm. The angel repeats the same words of the Lord Jesus Christ back in Jerusalem over two years earlier. He would not drown in the open seas, but would stand on trial before the emperor in Rome. This was not the end, not for him, or anyone else on board, they would all survive this ordeal. What is the effect of God speaking to Paul? Well, he regains his hope. He reconnects with his faith. He doesn't just believe in God, he believes God. He takes God at his word. God would spare not only him, but all those on board. Just when he needed it most, in the midst of the storm, when he had given up any thought of being saved, God speaks and Paul's faith is restored. And Paul shares his restored trust in God with his fellow seafarers as he speaks to them in their own despair. Verse 25 says this, So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. It's easy to believe in the existence of God. It's not difficult to see the handiwork of God in creation. Even in mankind, despite all his depravity and fallenness, we recognize his uniqueness among the created order and that he uniquely bears the image of God. The psalmist has written, the fool says in his heart there is no God, but it's entirely fitting Therefore, the National Atheist Day falls on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. So believing in God is one thing, but believing God is quite another. Believing God in the storms of life is what is really hard. 
having a firm grip on the promises of God in the still waters is undemanding, but clinging on to them in the stormy waters takes us to our limit. But the God who spoke to Paul in the storm also speaks to us. In the words of the hymn writer, Jesus calls us all the tumult of our life's world restless sea. Day by day, his voice is sounding, saying, Christian, follow me. How does he speak in the storm? Or well, through the preaching of God's word. It might just be a sentence or a phrase from a 25 minute sermon, but it touches our heart. It was a word straight to our heart and reassures us God knows what we're going through. But it might be through the listening ear and words of encouragement of a trusted Christian friend. Through their care, we understand God cares. It might be through a passage of scripture that grabs our attention and which keeps coming back to us. It might be through the small ways in which God makes himself known to us. A phone call, a letter, an act of kindness or an unexpected visit, little things which we look back upon, testify to God's grace on us and that we've not been forgotten. In the storms of life, God speaks to us. Along the journey of God, of life, God gives grace, evidence of his grace. In the storm, he speaks. And thirdly, in the storms of life, God overrules our circumstances. After two weeks of being at the mercy of the stormy sea, the mariners in the dead of night sense the ship is approaching land. They take soundings and discover the water is getting progressively shallower. Fear breaks out among the crew and they drop anchor from the stern, lest the ship drift onto the rocks and be dashed to pieces. But then an act of treachery is attempted. You may recall the notorious case of the cruise ship, the Costa Concordia, which in 2012 sailed too close to the coastline, struck a rock and began to sink. However, the captain left his ship prematurely with some 300 passengers still on board. While wanting to save his own skin, he was careless of the lives he was responsible for. Something similar threatens to happen here in verse 30. The seamen making out they were lowering the anchors from the bow were actually lowering the lifeboat in which they would attempt to get to land. They were not just abandoning ship, they were abandoning the, the passengers utterly dependent on their seafaring experience to get to shore safely. But God overrules. And who should cotton on to their deception? Well, none other than the Apostle Paul, the eyes and ears of God in this instance. He warns the centurion who orders the soldiers to intervene and the lifeboat is cut adrift before any of the sailors can get in. Everyone is now literally in the same boat. The centurion, the soldiers, the sailors, the prisoners and the Christian companions. Peril on the raging seas is a great equaliser. They would sink or swim together. But God overrules a second time. The ship is run aground on a sandbank. It breaks in two. The soldiers acting without authorization intend to kill the prisoners, fearing they would swim away, reach dry land and escape. It seems a brutal reaction, but under Roman law, a guard was responsible for his charge to the extent that if the prisoner escaped, the guard would bear the penalty due to the escapee. If the prisoners were indeed condemned men, the guards would therefore pay for their escape with their lives. So the soldiers' instincts are understandable. But even in the chaos of a shipwreck, with the bow section separated from the stern, and with water surging into the stricken vessel, God had not lost control of events. And this time, Julius, the centurion, 
is his agent. The centurion has the presence of mind to grasp what the soldiers intend, and chiefly because he does not want to see Paul die unjustly, gives the order that none of the prisoners are to be harmed. Instead, he gives the command to abandon ship. Those who could swim should jump overboard and get to land. Those who couldn't should hold on to the wreckage and reach land that way. And the God who overrules sees to it that everyone on board, 276 people, reach land safely. But what could have been a bloodbath of corpses actually becomes a miracle of salvation. Not one life is lost either to the sea or to the sword. In the midst of the storm, God overrules. Cornerstone is a modern hymn which has become very popular in churches today. It has this chorus. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Saviour's love, through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. I can remember vividly one Sunday being in the congregation at Hayes Lane Baptist Church and seeing a lady sing that hymn from the heart. Her husband had just been diagnosed with cancer, but she was holding on in faith to the God she had known since her childhood. And the God who held their times in his hands would see them through this particular storm, and he would have the final say in the events of their lives. For the journey of life, God gives ample evidence of his grace. In the storm he speaks to us, in the storm he overrules events and shows he is sovereign. The question however that hangs over this passage is this, if the Lord Jesus had revealed to Paul in his cell in Jerusalem those few years earlier he would get to Rome to preach the gospel, why did the journey to Rome prove such an ordeal? Why after leaving the port of Sidon did Paul's ship make such painfully slow progress to Fair Havens when it encountered those unfavourable winds? Why did Paul experience such tribulation from natural forces in the Mediterranean Sea when he was going where God wanted him to go? Surely the God who controls the wind and the waves could have given him an easier journey. Hadn't the apostle already been through enough hardship and suffering for Christ's sake? This is a question we all have to face at some point in our lives. We do what we believe to be right in God's sight, but immediately we encounter great adversity and trial. And they're scratching our heads and asking why. And we're tempted to think, well, give me a break, Lord. Don't you want me to get on and accomplish the task that you entrusted me with? I just seem to meet obstacle after obstacle. Why don't you make smooth my pathway? Why don't you make the people I have to deal with less obstinate and more obliging? In Paul's case, in the eye of the storm, the presence of God was an ongoing reality for him. He knew come what may, he belonged to God. When God spoke, he believed his assurance not one life would be lost to the storm. It's been said with some justification that a crisis does not make a person. A crisis shows what a person is made of. And this crisis showed that Paul was indwelt and full of the Holy Spirit. God spoke to the other 275 people on the ship through this servant of Jesus Christ. He used this man of faith to make the reality of Jesus Christ so very evident to a large number of pagan soldiers, sailors, and prisoners. None, I imagine, would have come through the experience unchanged. What a, what a cost. Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus had been pushed to the absolute limit of their resources, to the point of giving up all hope of being saved. As for us, mere mortals, not apostles, not close associates of Paul, why the storms? Well, 
No doubt on occasion, God uses adversity to teach us to trust him, to cling on to faith when God's providences seem to be running contrary to his promises. Perhaps on other occasions, he uses our reaction to suffering as a means to reveal himself to non-believers. God demonstrates the difference his grace can make in weak people when they're going through tough times. An unbeliever can see grace is not just a Christian buzzword, it's a reality. Grace gives God's adequacy to inadequate men and women. But we have to be honest. God sometimes allows storms for reasons we will never understand this side of eternity. There are no glib answers. The question of why did this happen will never be answered in this life. We torture ourselves asking why, but in the end we have no choice other than to accept we will never know. But when we face storms and shipwrecks with faith, even if it seems so little faith, even if it seems such insubstantial faith, even if it seems such paltry faith, we bring honour and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.